Um, okay, so, oh, perfect, the slide's already up. So, yeah, our uh, first um, keynote presentation this morning is with Eric Olson. Um, it's sponsored by MNP, of course, our title sponsor. And so I'll tell you a little bit about Eric before he comes up here. Eric is MNP's national leader of farm management consulting in Winnipeg, um, where it never goes to 40 below. <laughs> Eric helps owners of small and large farm operations make effective business decisions so they can increase the profitability of their farms and enhance their competitiveness um, through strategic management and benchmarking. Music to my ears, for sure. With more than 28 years working in the ag industry, Eric has an unparalleled understanding of local and international market conditions, which he uses to help producers grow their operations effectively and efficiently. To be in Canadian agriculture, you need a healthy combination of guts and heart. Eric will share his insights and experience on how you can convert risk into a competitive edge while relishing the journey of farm management. I feel like this was so well written. I don't know whoever wrote that, but uh, well done. So Eric, please uh, join me in welcoming you to the stage. Good morning, everybody. I didn't write that. I do, the I do love the word uh, a gumption, though. It's one of those old-fashioned words. It's like kerfuffle. How many times do you get to use kerfuffle when you're out there in the, in the real world? Not very often. Um, there's two things you do as you get older in the industry. First thing you do is you get a biopic done 14 years ago, and when they offer you a new one, don't get it. <laughs> and lie about how many years you've been in the industry. So it's 28, so our, our marketing people who did the gumption piece should have thought about this. I've been in the industry 35 years. And I'm glad Elaine's here. Thanks. Um, that was terrible. I apologize for that. It's the morning. Um, so here's what our agenda is. I'm going to talk a little about MNP. We've got to do an ad. We always do an ad sponsor. That's part of the deal. Um, we're going to have a little bit of fun. We're going to do some introductions. That's usually a little bit fun. I'm going to talk a little bit about farming in the past. Um, Agriculture is a really cool industry. I've got the uh, privilege to work with farmers for years. We were talking about it last night. I think I've been, probably been on a th over a thousand farms from right across the country, which has been fantastic for me. Talk a little bit about gumption, a uh, little bit about strategic planning. Elaine talks about Peter Manis. He's one of my, he's a consultant that's worked with me for 17 years. So Pete told me when I come here to tell them this is Pete's line, we're going to trick all the farmers into, into planning. They naturally don't want to plan. Talk a little bit about risk. That is Steve Funk. You saw Steve. I've worked with Steve for as long as he's been with M&P. It's been a fantastic journey and a few clothing, so clothing thoughts. So I'm going to do these really quick. So why is M&P, why is ag important to us? So we started in Brandon, Manitoba. <laughs> Thank you, Lane. <laughs> um, we started in Brandon. So back in the day in Brandon is where we started. So in 2000, we rebranded to MNP as we moved into Ontario. And to this day, we're still Myers Norris Penny. If you're in Brandon, we're still Myers Norris Penny, which isn't that bad. So we started there. Obviously, ag was important to us. So we're now a national firm. Over the last, so when I started with MNP, and it's funny because we talk about planning and we do planning all the time and strategic planning at the firm, just like you do. I'll remind you, I'm going to take a stop right now. Remember, as farmers, you run large, complicated businesses. Never let someone say you're just a farmer, because you're not. So we've moved across the country. That was our strategy. And we're going to talk about strategy. So when I first started with firm, we said we wanted to be the preeminent uh, accounting firm in, in the prairies. And then we moved to BC. Well, then it's Western Canada. Well, OK, now we're moving to Ontario. So we threw in the world Canada. So in the last few years, we've actually gone from coast to coast. And I've had the privilege to work for clients from Newfoundland right across to BC, so it's been really nice. We have 700. Stu's, Stu's on your council, Stuart Person. He is the person I, I, um, I work directly with or I report to. Stuart is a fantastic advocate for agriculture. Um, he, he just lives and breathes it. And Stu, Stu and uh, our team, so we have an ag management team, we've developed 700 members. So when you come into M&P, and I can't always guarantee this, and you're a farmer, we're still to be able to talk to you and talk your language. And I think that's what we expect. A little bit about our services. There's a whole list here. A couple things that are important to farmers. Uh, the Ag Risk Management Resources. AJ was here. That's what Steve, that's what Steve basically hit it up and started. 
So there was, I don't have it here, but when we started, there used to be a, I used to keep it, there was a picture of a little, a little building and a little smokestack, and it was accounting firm, and then accounting firm after business risk management, and it was like a 10-story building. So it's getting complicated, and I would tell you this, as we talk about this a little bit, it's not that complicated. And if your provider can't explain it to you, you need someone different. So, where's my backwards? Here we go. So I'll give you a little bit about my background. So um, I have roots that go right back to, uh, to homesteading in Saskatchewan. So my great-grandparents homesteaded in, um, in an area in Saskatchewan called Manor. Manor, Saskatchewan. So I got a question. Does anyone here know where Manor, Saskatchewan is? Elaine does. You do. So what's the closest town to Manor, Saskatchewan? Oh, come on, people. Because we have prizes this morning. We're getting rider hats. People want rider hats. No, not Swift Current. Not Saskatoon. I can't give it to Saskatoon. Who said Carlisle? Here you go. Come and get your hat. Nobody's, nobody's more excited than someone from Saskatchewan. This presentation would have been way better, way better if the Bombers would have won. Okay. So there's, there's Manor, Saskatchewan. I grew up in central Manitoba in a little town called McGregor. So I grew up on a, on a grain and cattle farm. I'm going to talk about my dad in a minute. And, uh, and so I grew up in this grain and cattle farm, and I, ha I grew up on what you would say in the, in the 70s and 80s was a typical farm. So when we talk about planning, I can tell you every mistake because my family made it. So where is McGregor? What's the no closest town in McGregor, Manitoba? <laughs> You're going to get a bomber hat. you got to get the bomber Any, Anybody? I'm going to go with that. So there's McGregor. It's right between Austin and Portage. So where's one of the kids? Somebody from Lethbridge. There you go. Wear this, wear this next time you're around when you're, when you're going to this college. There you go. So I grew up in McGregor. I live this. You guys, it's interesting. Paul Harvey had that, um, and, and God made a farmer, right? On the eighth day, God looked down on his, on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer, right? And that is a picture of a stoic farmer getting up, working 40 hours by Tuesday, doing the school board meeting, right? Stoic farmer. That's what I grew up with. That's what my father was, a stoic farmer. And this is how things have changed. One note, I was down at a DTN conference in, in, um, in Chicago. We had 600 farmers from Iowa. And Dodge had just came out with that Dodge made a farmer for their Dodge commercial. And they sponsored, and they had five Dodge half tons in the back. There were 600 farmers. They played that. They got a standing ovation, sold 40 trucks that day. Because God made a farmer. So this is what I grew up with. This is an example. So my father's the smallest one in this picture. So that's my heritage. And that was in McGregor. That was my Uncle Donald and my Uncle, my Uncle Johnny. They're all, they've all passed. But I have a question. Anyone know anything about horses here? There you go. So here comes the test. This should make you stand up. So why does the smallest one, that's my dad, 1938, why does he have the biggest horse? And for that, <laughs> you get a rider too. <laughs> that's exactly right. But that, that, that was the heritage back then. That's what it was. The other piece that I, I talk about my background is Manor, Saskatchewan. So I have my great-grandparents' books from the 30s. So I thought before we got into what we're doing today, we would look a little bit back at what they had to deal with. First thing you got to notice is, you ever heard of my John Deere? They're a, they're a sponsor, right? So John Deere was, in, was into farm data back in the 30s because my, grandparent, my grandmother's accounting book was issued by John Deere. Moline, Illinois. So they're already in the data back in the day. So this is the farm looked like. They had a half, half section of land in Manor, Saskatchewan. Four cows, a bull, and six calves. In her books, everything's got a name. And, and the, name, the name of the bull is Stanley. Absolutely Stanley. 
28 laying hens, five turkeys, 10 horses, 13 sheep used. And as you guys get to know me, you're going to understand this more. So the time when my family made the most money was when my great-grandfather sold horses. So I've been a horse trader for a long time. <laughs> and he did genetically modified horses. He crossed Shetland ponies with workhorses. Think about that one. And he got premiums for it. That's how we made money. Yeah, they actually had to dig a hole for the mare. This was the workhorse. The mare was the workhorse. Everybody was thinking of that one, weren't you? Um, but that's what a year looked like on the farm in Manor, Saskatchewan. This was a good year, too. The $250 off their half section of wheat. In 19, I think it was, it's in one of the books here, um, they had, they got $3.90 off a half section, or a quarter section of uh, wheat. It was, now that's tough, right? Where'd they put their money? It, they spent 33% of their money went to, for living. And my, I learned a couple things that my great-grandfather never met him before. Learned one thing, every time he went to town he had a beer, because my grandmother wrote it in the book. And he smoked a little bit. Farm expenses, it was, like, it was like horse harness. It was interesting. So their net income that year was $237. My great-grandparents had a bad year in the 30s, and they borrowed money from their rich son-in-law who owned two shoe stores in Saskatoon because he had the money, right? They were doing sustained agriculture. They were just trying to make a living and get through the year. That's what it looked like for them. And they would have looked like that Paul Harvey and God made a farmer because they worked hard, right? And when we talk about that, the word gumption, I, I kind of make, I say this kind of in, in jest when I said it wasn't up to me. I talk with our marketing people, we're kind of coming up, and you gotta have something that's got a little bit of a jump when you get in front of people, right? And they came up with the word gumption. All I could think of is shenanigans and kerfuffle. That's, I had to use those in a sandwich. No one ever uses this. So I looked it up, courage and confidence. That makes me think agriculture. I don't care who you are and what you do, You've got courage and confidence. Resilience. Does the crop ever not come off? Does the crop ever not go in? There are years. 2000, okay, easy. I was around 99, 19, 2011. 1999, I think, was a bad year. The, the crop usually goes in. I live in Winnipeg. We have the Red River Valley, right? Historical floods. The crop goes in after the flood. An execution. I threw that one in myself. Because as farmers, what you have to think about is that you're resilient and you execute. Successful farmers are resilient and they execute. And you run large businesses. I always remind my clients of this. Don't ever be flippant about what you do. So I work in downtown Winnipeg. So that's where my office is. And I talk too much about sports. So the, the Winnipeg Jets are clients of ours. So everybody in the firm has to cheer for them, and they don't, but they should. <laughs> Our office is right beside the arena, and we have lots of guys rolling in, including Jets players once in a while, coming into our office. And I have clients that are farmers that come in wearing a ball cap, because they're not from Alberta or BC, so they don't got, they're not ranchers, they're farmers, and they walk in, and they're worth more, and they're better businessmen than most of the people that we would think are big businessmen in downtown Winnipeg. Our firm doesn't deal with Richardson's. We deal with owner-operated. So never take a step back and think about the complexity of your businesses going forward because they are complex and you're doing a good job of what you're doing. So we're going to talk a little bit about planning. One of my favorite quotes, Warren Buffett. Ever heard of him? He's made a dollar or two in his day. Someone is sitting in the shade of a in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. So as we start talking generational farms, they need to think about, we're doing this because someone started this a long time ago, and I'm, I'm picking up the torch and I'm moving forward. And part of this, we, we talk about strategic planning, I talked about being strategic, but I'm just going to talk about a SWOT analysis. What a strategic plan does, it's a long-term plan. Um, who was up here? I, I forgot his name. The, the, the other morning he said, Dave said, plan one year ahead. Yeah, you need to plan one year ahead, but you also got to know where your goalposts are. I do professional negotiation with clients. So a client comes in to me and says, I'm doing this, I need help, can you help me negotiate? First thing I ask them, so what's a win? You got to know what a win is. 
Because if you don't know what a win is, you just never stop negotiating, right? Just keep going. So a SWOT analysis, what it does, it's an exercise or a strategic plan that you as a group, so if you have a family as part of the operation, bring them all together. Talk about your business together. This communication, Elaine talked about communication. I can tell you a lot of scary, scary stories about communication. I, I'm, I'm an example of that. I'm a farm consultant, 35 years. I work for the largest ag accounting firm in Canada. And my dad, so I grew up, we had 150 cows, owned a section and a half of land, 200 ewes, anyone in the sheep. So one year we decided, my brother-in-law is an accountant, so him and I together, we are a lethal combination. <laughs> Think about it. So we're like, we're going to get out of farming. Dad said, Dad's getting older. He was like 70. I'm like, we're going to sell the cows, Dad. So I owned cattle with them, and quite frankly, I was tired of cows a little bit. I know everyone loves cattle, and it sounds terrible, but I was driving back. So we did all the plans, did all the tax stuff, you know, all that early tax stuff you do. Well, we were ready to go. And I was there, and we're gonna, that spring, we're going we're gonna to calve them out, put them on pasture. Next fall, we were going to uh, sell, sell everything. And my dad sat me down at Christmas and said, so I'm looking at bulls for the next few years. Nobody else in the family caught on but me. I'm like, what do you mean you're looking at bulls? We're selling the cattle. Uh, that's what you guys did. It kept you busy for a while. I'm not selling the cattle. So then we finally did sell the cattle. My dad had Parkinson's. We had to sell the cattle. So that time I got smarter. I drove, I went in, put on, I actually can look like a, like a farmer, not like a rancher. Can't wear the hat. It just doesn't work for my hair. I don't have much hair. It doesn't work. So we went in there, loaded the trucks up, loaded the cattle down the road. It's there at Christmas. He's like, you're going to get up and help me with chores. I'm like, chores, Dad, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, you're losing it a bit, buddy. We don't have any cattle anymore. Yeah, I hit a few. <laughs> Took them over to the neighbor and hid them. So we still had cattle. <laughs> so I'm an example of what not to do in terms of planning. So let's talk about the challenges of planning, strategic planning. We're going to talk about what this is. First is communication. I'm a great one to lecture people about communication. I've been on lots of farm clients, lots of farm calls, and I've seen clients that don't communicate. That stoic farmer, that doesn't work anymore in your business unless you want to be a little farmer by yourself. Because there's none of these businesses aren't growing without employees. So you can't be the stoic farmer anymore. But you don't have to be a chatterbox like me, right? But you do need to think about strategies, how you can communicate. Elaine's right. Recency bias. I put that in there for a reason. It will always be good in grain farming. So I, I, I work for, um, part of the jobs I do, I do the state agriculture for the credit union system in Manitoba. So I, I present to the, the Deposit Guarantee Corporation, and I tell them what agriculture looks like in Manitoba. And I told them last year, that it was a historical year. We've never seen grain prices like this ever before. We have historical incomes. This was a fantastic year. Said the same thing about cattle this year, right? About time the cow-calf guys got a little bit. As a, the worst thing in the cow-calf business is, feedlot guys have private jets. Guys like me that grew up in a cattle farm, we had 15-year-old half tons. So that, I never thought that was fair. So the reason he buys, stuff changes. And you got to plan for it and think about it. So when we talk about strat planning, you need to be thinking about that. It's not always going to be the same. Wealth. Farmers hate when I say this. I was up at Dauphin last year, did a presentation to a group of farmers. And I said, you guys are wealthy. You're rich. And this guy in the back said, you keep saying that. I don't agree with that. I'm like, ah. Oh. So he calls me out in front of a bunch of people. So I asked him a question, what kind of half ton you're driving? And a guy in the front goes, you just bought a new platinum Ford, uh. <laughs> don't apologize for it. Don't apologize for it. You don't have to be, don't have to apologize. You work hard, you run sophisticated businesses. The value of your, uh, the value of your land's gone up. It's a challenge for, strate for succession planning. But let's, let's think of a worse challenge. I worked for FTC for 10 years before I came to MNP. My first five years, I worked in a little place in western Manico Manitoba called Verdon. And I foreclosed on grain farmers for a living. You want a shitty job? Of course, they put guys that are like 21 and aren't very bright doing it. 
I don't think I've gotten any smarter, but that was grain farmers. We see some headwinds in some other industries. We're going to talk a little bit of that as we get into SWAT. Here's why farmers also don't like doing long-term planning. Lots of you have it in your head. And I know what we're doing. I know where we're going. You got to share it with you got to share it with the team. You got to pick out who your team is. It's your family. Go home and have a discussion about it. Because if you're not talking to your son or daughter about getting part of the farm, they're going to leave because they're talented and they're smart. Think about that. So what a strategic plan should be, it should be a growth plan or a plan of what you're doing with your business. And it should ultimately be a succession plan and an exit strategy for you. Because how do you do a, 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 a strategic plan without talking about how you're going to get out? And how do you do it without saying who's going to be managing it going forward? It can't be just, I'm going to buy another half section. It has to be about management. And there has to be communication in it. And that's really what, when we do these right, um, they work really well. I work with a large farm, one of the largest potato farms in Manitoba, and they do a formal strategic plan, and they actually get together for a weekend. And let's be honest, you farm 2,500 acres of potatoes, you got lots of stuff going on. They take the time to get together for a weekend with their management, which is their family, immediate family, their managers. They let us kind of come in on there and, and help out. We help facilitate a bit, but they run it, and we talk about where the business is going. And we do a short-term plan for next year, like we talked yesterday. And we talk about what the long goalposts were. And that, that has made them extremely successful because their sons are coming into the farm, they have three sons, with confidence that there's a place for them. And the sons have responsibilities. I like this part. I see some of these, and so I grew up in a, I, I was, we were at a rich farm. We were in a big farm where I grew up. And you always had the one kid that rolled in, and you know, his dad's got a little more acres, got the new four-wheel drive, right? You know, got an 855 Versatile, that's pretty cool. That's how old I am. <laughs> and that farm, I still remember it, that farm isn't in business anymore. Because, not because they decided it. We, we and with our farm, it was too small. Honestly, my farm was too, our family farm was too small. Theirs wasn't in business because the kids failed. Because they, they thought just because dad was a great farmer that they somehow had a natural ability to be a great farmer. I tell you one thing that I think is really cool in today in agriculture, our young kids, these guys here, they're not taking that for granted. They're working, they're going to school. How many people here graduated? Oh, I, got, I love this one. How many graduated in the 80s or the 90s? Well, I'm gonna go with the 80s. How many people graduated from the 80s? Okay, I'm gonna go with the 70s or 80s. How's that? There's a bigger group. So I have kids that come and apply for jobs. We're always recruiting. Their GPA is almost double what mine was. I don't think M&P would hire me now. It was a different time. So again, we gotta trust that. We gotta trust the next generation and understand they're smart and they're human. So part of this about recency bias. What, this is a Pete Manis quote. He does this with our clients right now as we do the, that grain benchmark. We do the benchmarking in, in uh, Eastern Manitoba and, and, and Western, Eastern Saskatchewan, Western Manitoba. What do you do when you're, what you do when you're winning sets the groundwork for when you're not. Regency bias -y. You're not gonna get $23 for your canola for the rest of your life. Labor, <laughs> I wish you would. Labor, power, and equipment. What is your cost of machinery? What's your cost of finance? Those are the things that we need to work on and you need to work on. And that's laying the groundwork for down the road. Always, always, people talk about this. What's your competitive edge? Understand your edge. Why are you successful in business? Is it because you're, you're good at high yields? You're a really good producer? Better at marketing? I have a client that's fantastic at marketing. He, he's in the top of our benchmark. He grows average crops and markets better than anyone they do. You know his marketing technique is? He's a bear marketer. He is the most negative person you ever met when it comes to marketing. Not a negative person, but he's like, yeah. He's always thinking that it's gonna go down and he's always, he's pulling triggers because he actively manages. Low operating costs, strong working capital. Today, if you're in the grain world, you probably have pretty strong working capital. Our dairy clients right now are having some struggles, and, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So again, know your competitive advantage on your farm. So let's talk about strategic planning, or SWOT plan. So the first one's strength, this is internally. So think about it, what do you do well? How do others view your strength? What skills are unique to you? This is what you do well. 
So I, I should point out somebody and make them ask them that question, but most people hate this part of planning because we're Canadian, we don't want to brag. What do you do well? Oh, I don't know, it just kind of happens. You know what every farmer that does well does? They execute. They get the crop in. So when I was a lender and we had clients that were having issues and we looked at stuff on them, sometimes we assessed, we'd say they had bad timing. You know what that meant? They were dragging their air seeder out of the bush while everybody else was seeding, right? Bad timing. Execution is execution, and I think that's important. So you gotta understand, right? What are my strengths? What do I do well? Everybody, so we do this with clients. I get lists of weaknesses. Oh my gosh. So why don't you go to that? Well, I'm, I'm terrible at human resources. I'm terrible at this. Or as a family, when you do this, <laughs> you love when you ask your son, so what I'm not good at, right? What am I not good at? What are we not good at? Well, dad, we're, you're shitty at communication. No, I'm not. Remember that. I had a colleague who took a course, this is funny, who, who went to um, um, like a management training and we got, he, they went to all the employees and we got to, we got to basically critique them. And he, he thought he was a visionary leader. And he came back and, and of course they said, so we're gonna critique someone, someone give us their stuff, he put up his hand. Well, you have to do me because I'm a visionary leader, trust me. He got up there and it said he was a shitty leader. Came back, sat us all down and went, look it, I'm a visionary leader, who said this about me? And I'm like, it was him. <laughs> can I get his office? Weaknesses are, are important because you can turn them into strengths. Personal, personal example, I work at an accounting firm. I have a degree in agriculture. You know why they hired Aggies at M&P? Are you guys taping this? I hope you are. You know why they hired Aggies at M&P? They need someone in the firm with a personality. <laughs> we, did, we did strategic planning, or uh, at the firm we do practice management, which is timesheets. You guys want to go through an exercise? Keep track of six minutes of your day. I've been doing it for 25 years. We get excited. Hey, Will's over there. Will's a colleague of mine. We get excited if we're not filling out our timesheets. Ezio came from government, right? Ezio must love that. But Ezio was our marketing guy. So he just goes marketing all day. That was great. So I also came from a sales background. FCC, they taught us sales. I was lending money, right? Think about lending money in sales. I'm selling money. It's like selling cocaine. You guys want it, and I got it. How hard is that? Sorry for our friends in bank. I know there's risk and a whole lot of stuff, but I always like saying that. So my boss sits me down and goes, you know, Eric, we have no one in the firm that can sell like you out of Winnipeg. You can talk to clients that love you. And you can't fill out your timesheets, and you can't, you can't organize your shit. So get your stuff together, because that's what it takes to be, a, to be a partner. But they probably should have fired me at some point, because I wasn't good at it. But no one else could do the other piece. So I, I actually sat down and went, okay, I'm going to do that. Now I'm better at it than everyone else because I decided I, would, I was going to get good at it. You can turn weaknesses into strengths really quickly. So this is the bigger word. So we do opportunities at a SWAT plan. We're talking about industry opportunities. What's out there? What are the trends? I was talking to someone last night and they did uh, direct marketing with beef. I apologize if, I don't, if you're here or maybe you had a little too, much, too, too many drinks. That's looking at your, at your business and looking at ways you're going to make a profit of your business, right? Turkeys, right? There you go. How do I can turn my strengths into opportunities? Again, you're looking at opportunities out there. I'm going to do a seed plant because I know everyone's going to need seed and I can get an extra value for my crop. Bad day in a seed plant is they don't get a good crop because they're cleaning their own seed in a lot of cases. So opportunities. Let's talk about threats. This is one I talk to lots of clients about. And when we get talking about threats, you got to look at your industry and you got to be realistic and you can't use recency bias when you look at it. And I got a great example in Manitoba and in Saskatchewan. Does anyone ever heard of the PMU industry? So in Manitoba and, and Eastern Saskatchewan, it was a big deal. So <laughs> I got a bonus at FCC because of the PMU industry because it expanded in the, the, like 92, 93. So what it did was they were, they were basically taking pregnant bear urine and producing um, um, an estrogen drug with it. And so they wanted natural. So that's why they had these mares. And, and I lent money to every cowboy in western Manitoba and eastern Saskatchewan wanted one of those. And they put up these, these huge barns, very profitable. So what was the issue with the, so I got it, I had it written down. 
1999, there was 430 pregnant, pregnant mare urine farms. Today, there's 12. They had one, they sold the one, one, one spot, one user. And when that user decided they were going to move, they, lost, they, they went out of business. So one of the things we talk about when we look at threats, what's that threat for you? If I'm growing grain, probably I'm not going to get taken out of business like that. But I've got to worry about some things. 35% of the world lives where? China or India. So I'm, I'm not going to get into supply managed different things. We export a lot of products. And who, what's the two countries that, and I'm not talking politics, but we do have some issues with, China and India. So we just took out 35% of the population. It's 2.8 billion. India's now got a higher population than China. So India's got 900 million Hindus who do not eat beef. But they got 600 million or 500 million people that do eat beef. So I think we need to get some beef over there too, just for the beef side. So it's interesting. You need to look at that and you need to see there's opportunities in that, but you gotta look at what you're doing too and say, is this a sound business? It's either the smartest guy, probably the guy who sold in 1998, if you had a, dairy, a PMU farm sold to a neighbor, that was probably a guy who got lucky. But you gotta think about that when you look at your businesses. What are the opportunities, what are the threats? A couple things about a strat plan. It's about communication. I know, I, I talked, to, I'm kind of running over this. this. This takes, like this should not be a, this isn't a one and done event. These are events that you should revisit it. And it's not, it, when, you, when I say revisit it, it's not, it's not always pleasant. Because not everything's always going good. Easiest time to talk to your grain farm was last year. How are things? Things are great. Fantastic. Um, but it's a great thing to do. And on your, I, I, had a, I had a client who quoted me this the other day. We were chatting about, I don't do, I don't do, I do strat planning, which ends up being some succession planning. We have other colleagues that do that because I can't handle the crying. <laughs> I feel terrible when someone cries. But we got into it with a strat plan and we were chatting with clients. And, and I said, and, and his, him and his son do not get along well, right? Communication's bad, but they're getting better. And at one point, the father goes, look it, I do not want the train station to be the way I do my strat plan, or my uh, succession plan, right? I don't want to take Junior to the train station. And it was funny, because everybody laughed about it, but you thought about it, right? You got to communicate. And you got, if you can't, you got to get people that can help you do it. And there are people at MP that can help you too, too. We got Pete Manis, we got guys like that. We do have people that probably don't have that skill set as you, would that be right? But then we'll find someone that can help you out. Write it down. You need to write this stuff down. I got the greatest example of writing stuff down. Anyone here has ever got a job offer? Anyone here ever asked, so I hire lots of kids. So I, we got 35 people on our farm management side. When I started there, there was two. We have like 35 now. So I've hired lots of people. So I go, so what do you want for a salary? Oh, I want between fifty and sixty thousand dollars. Oh, I'll write you up an offer between sixty and seventy thousand, fifty and sixty thousand dollars. So this is what I do with them. I stop and go, whoa. I heard fifty, you heard sixty. What do you want? You write it down, and everybody always gets weird about it. Well, I do handshakes. Oh God. <laughs> I did a handshake with my dad, and I spent. $10,000 on, on, uh, on legal fees to get him ready to sell his cows, and he told me to go jump stumps, right? So, again, write it down. It's amazing what happens when it's written down, and then someone can argue with it, going, ah, I don't agree with that. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. We've got to get somewhere, right? Mental health. I have, in agriculture... We lose people once in a while because of this. Um, in lending, they taught us, I was taught how to handle my emotions in emotional situations. And we had people with a lot of emotions. I had colleagues that worked with the Farm Debt Reboard back in the day. Uh, another colleague of mine that worked just retired from MMP, Ian Craven. So I've worked with Ian for 35 years. I felt sorry for Ian Craven. We had a talk one day. So we did Farm Debt Reboard negotiating back in the day. This might come back again, <laughs> unfortunately. So they sent me out to Verdon. I was 21 years old in a one-person office in FCC. You know why they sent me to Verdon? Nobody else would go there, and he's too dumb not to. 
But I thought it was because I was fantastic. And I became a farm debt negotiator. So we would have these stressful situations with these farmers that were losing, losing their houses. And we get in these stressful situations. And Ian's job and Elaine's job was to control me. Because I'd get in there and we've got all these negotiating skills. We'd sit down. So here's a, here's a, little, a little tidbit in negotiating. You ever get in a, you're dealing on a, on a tractor, things aren't going your way? One of my ones I was taught was get up and leave. Just walk out. You're leaving? Yeah, it's not going well for me. <laughs> Nothing going good. I'm out. The other one to change the power position, and this sounds goofy, but it works, stand up. Stretch your leg. Oh, my knee's sore. I've got to stand up. Be on the table now. People think like that when they negotiate with you. Think about that. Mental health is important, though, on the farm. Having a plan, having it written out, having a cash flow, and knowing it's not going to be that bad. It's not great, but we're going to get through the year. It, it makes you turn from worry and wasted energy to execution again. Because now you know how to execute. Because you've got to know how to execute. <laughs> so, what am I talking about? If you Google fat smoker on the internet, you get this big fat smoker, you get this dude over here, and you get this other guy. <laughs> David Meister. It's a kind of a cool book to read. I just brought it up, I was thinking about this. Because he talks about a fat smoker, the strategy of the fat smoker. And he, I saw, there's a video on YouTube, and it was interesting. He talks about, it's a little bit about execution and knowing. He said, most people know what they should do. He had a heart. So, we went through the pandemic. Everybody went through the pandemic. Would you guys call it the pause, which is a nice way of putting it? The great pause, yeah. I, so, I'm running, tw at that point, we had about 25 people in FMC. And we sent everybody home. We spend all our time on farms. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to have to get another job because this ain't going to go well. Sitting up in my second-story house in St. Mattel, Manitoba, that was, or, that was terrible. But what this fat smoker talks about is he was overweight and he smoked. So anyone here that's overweight and smokes, I always have to try to do stuff, right? I work out because I, I have an office job. I don't actually work physically, right? So I know i got to go to the gym, so I go to the gym. Got back to the gym, things are doing good. But when I'm talking about a fat smoker, and you all are out there can think of this, there are things you should do, you know you shouldn't do it, and for some reason you don't do it. That's the fat smoker. So if you're overweight and you smoke, and you go see your doctor, what does your doctor say? Well, keep up smoking, maybe put on a few more pounds, that'd be fantastic. Tell you to lose weight and quit smoking. And you know you should, but you don't. Talks about strategies about how to, how to start doing something different. Warren Buffett. Here we go. Only when the tide goes out, you discover who's swinging, swimming naked. So I have a family cabin on a, little, on a beach called Delta Beach on the Lake Manitoba. So it's got tide. It's got like the, the water goes in and out. It's like a big bathtub. So I don't, you don't, it actually takes you, you've got to go at 600, 600 feet to get wet, to get over your head. So nobody skinny dips, so we don't have that problem because it's, it's more like streaking and it's kind of weird. So let's talk about tools. So you have, if you have a strategy and you know where you're going, you want to mitigate risk. How do you mitigate risk? Well, you know, I go in, I, so why did you lock in $20 a bushel on your canola? I had, we do peer groups in Regina. I, I manage those. We've got some of the biggest, biggest grain farms in, in, in eastern Saskatchewan we work with. And it, it's great, it's great. So we're, last year we are talking about locking in and they're all like, I'm waiting for $24. Well, they're, they're pretty fat in cash, they could do that. So we, we gave them a, a challenge, go out and do your budgets. So we all helped them out with budgets, and they looked at it. And we go, okay, now that you have a budget, you can mitigate risk, because you can quantify it and you can mitigate it. Otherwise, you're just having some fun, right? The same. So we had, that was in November, I was at a meeting. And you know, you can put those, 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 those stops, like you can go in and say, through Cargill, I want to sell my weed at whatever price. Well, they had a discussion that the, that the corridor with the Ukraine and Russia, it's closed now, but it was going to close, and wheat went limit up. And these guys sold more wheat than they ever thought, and they were all pissed off. Oh, my God, it's going to go higher. And I'm like, boo-hoo, boo-hoo, you made $500 an acre. I feel bad for you. <laughs> you got to quantify it. What did Steve Funk do? Steve, Steve and M&P understand agri-stability because we quantified it by real numbers. So when we look at it, when we do an agri-risk, so we call it an ARMP, Agri-Risk Management Planner. We do a budget, and then we put in agri-stability. We layer in other risk management programs. That's in... For you guys in the, for you cash croppers, 
in, uh, I always want to get that weird. I got I to gotta say this. I come to Ontario. We start up our office. Will works at our office in Ontario. I go and see my first big, big grain. Uh, it, was a, it was a hog and, and cash cropper. And I get and we're chatting. I'm like, so how big's your grain farm? And the guy looks at me and goes, you said you were from central Canada. Well, I am. I'm from Winnipeg, <laughs> central Canada. He's like, no, you're from western Canada. I'm a cash cropper. I'm not a grain farmer. So it's taken me to learn that one. So you got to understand that, those programs. You layer them in crop insurance, and then you can quantify what your loss is. Last year in Saskatchewan and in western Manitoba, we had clients that we did this planning for, and they, they took their agri-stability, they took their crop insurance. They were guaranteed not to lose money last year. Think about that. We had their whole budget in, all their costs, including their fixed costs. They knew they were going to make money with the... They could have a complete crop failure. They were going to make money the way their margins were. They had a good year, so no one used the program. That's what's available to you. The other thing is, stop saying it doesn't work. Because what Steve and, and Stu have done with agri-stability, and you guys might not like this, we said this is a margin-based disaster program, and this is how it works. If you don't know how it works, phone someone from MNP and spend some time with us you don't have, we can show you the concept. It works for what it's meant to work for. Because what, we're, what, what scares MNP, and, and we're being paternal here, is that the government then just throws it all out. It says, okay, we're gonna go ad hoc again. Everybody remember ad hoc? Elaine does. There, I picked on Elaine again. We're gonna give you $10 an acre as a, as a cash, good luck. You need to understand the program. There's now private tools coming in, right? Talk about GARS, AGI3, I think they're on the panel later today, right? That's a a new private one. I like doing this, the production contracts versus the risk contracts. Oh, gosh. So I'm going to just do personal experience. 2021, oh, there you are, right in the front row. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, we talk production and risk, right? So we have a production contract and a, and a risk contract. So everybody lost their crops in eastern Saskatchewan. It was dry 2021. Best year ever, though, between crop insurance, GARS. Crop insurance, GARS, agri stability. Guys, like best year ever. Ridiculous year. I told one client, just think, you, gotta, you, get to, you only have to take half the grain to the elevator and you're making twice as much money. Uh, still wasn't happy about it, but farmers would rather grow a big crop at a lower price than grow a, than grow a, a smaller pri a crop at a higher price. But there's that, I always look at a p pendulum. You, you trade one for the other. I actually spoke on Real Life Radio about this, and I said, like, clients need to think about locking in something, right? Or actively not locking in something. Stop and think of what I said actively making decisions. Part of risk management is understanding your risk, and quantifying it, and then making a decision. Hey, why don't, why don't farmers go to Las Vegas? Not enough, they're not enough juice. Like really, I put $100 down in blackjack? I'd rather put three million out in the field than hope it rains. Like, <laughs> these guys are, these guys don't understand gambling. I'm terrible at gambling. I hate losing, and I know I'm gonna lose. And I have, my wife is fantastic. She is the night, like, she's nothing like me. And we go, and she loses $200 at a table, you, you know, we pick, and she thanks them and tips them. I'm like, you don't tip them when they take your money. It was really nice. Okay. Yeah. She's an HR consultant. She has a lot of work to do. So we talk about that pendulum, though. So understand what that, where that is, and don't be scared of doing it. And, and you're not trying to get the top of the market. You're trying to limit risk. It's risk. You're going to hear a lot more about risk than what I can, I can tell you. We specialize in the big, the big business risk and talking about it and quantifying it. So out of an ARMP, we can tell you that at the end of the day, the worst you can do is lose $20 an acre, it's 300000 whatever the number is. And then you can decide how you can manage it. You're good at managing pieces like that. Talk about debt. It's a great tool. It is a great tool. You're going to hear us talk again about debt. My colleague, Trevor Elix, the other partner, 20, 43 years old, his whole business career interest rates have never went up, ever. Can you imagine? Went down every year. Well, they went up. <laughs> People think it's bad, too. Debt is not bad. If you manage it right, you're leveraging it. I'm old enough that I went to University of Manitoba. I have a degree in agriculture. I have a degree in ag economics. One of our profs at that time said, you know what, go out. If you're going to farm, leverage as much as you can. Because land prices are going up 10% a year, and the rates you're boring at is 8, so you're making 2%. So just go to town. Yeah, 
Those guys aren't in business anymore. Again, you gotta, you got to understand that. you got to do a budget to understand it. Don't hope. Here's one of the things that's scaring me right now in debt. What's your debt strategy? You've got quite a bit of debt, sir. What are you going to do? Well, I'm hoping it goes down. Well, fantastic. I hope I win the lottery, but I'm not guaranteeing that. I thought I'd just show a couple of stats, and this is for all of, this all of Canada. This shows the, uh, the amount of debt held by operations. Potato farms average $3 million. Um, kind of goes down where the debt is, where it sits with de uh, potatoes, dairy, poultry, hogs. Grain farmers is probably the lowest. So this is, this is a Manitoba stat. And what this does is we, we leveraged in uh, average debt and then we, we did it, divided it by net cash. So this is how many years it takes you to pay back your debt, just by industry. This isn't perfect because we have grain farmers on, on paper through StatsCan probably have 100 acres and no debt, right? But what it shows on average, the average grain farmer will take them four years with their net income as of 2021 to pay back all their debt. 13 years for a dairy farmer. 13 years to pay off debt. And, and one of the things that, that's concerning us when we look at different industries, and I don't want to get gloom and doom here, but our dairy, our dairy clients, we're, we're going to start working with them a lot closer about where they're at. They've been well served by the banks. That's a nice way of saying maybe a bit overserved. And we can't have a strategy of we hope it goes down before my loan comes due. Because I think, what do, what do you guys think? So I have no idea where interest rates are going, right? But I know they're not going down to 1.7 in the next year and a half, right? So you need to think about that. A couple clothing, so clothing thoughts. You guys remember when GPS came in? Who here doesn't have GPS when they're, when they're farming, right? Everyone's got GPS. Is it, I was the example of the worst cultivator driver in Manitoba. There, my sh our shit looked, my dad would just be embarrassed. He would only let me cultivate when I first got going fields that weren't by the road. <laughs> don't, want the, don't want the neighbors to see. So I think data is going to become more and more important. And right now it is, it is unorganized, it is dirty, and it doesn't help you manage your business. And in a lot of cases, it is really cool. Like nothing favorite, X9, seeing one of my clients showing me he's doing 300 bush acre corn on his X9, you know, he's videotaping his monitor. But then when he, when he pulls across and he twists around and comes back in, he's getting zero. So what is his average yield, right? So you gotta clean the data. So we have some projects that we're working on. This is led by Stuart, Shea Furster. We think data is gonna be really important to help clients make decisions and make more money. So one of the things we think you gotta do is you gotta be able to organize it and you gotta clean it. It has to be data that makes sense. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it's got to be more perfect than you pull it off. And we want you to make decisions with it. The next thing that's coming to get hit farmers, remember I started off and I talked about my dad, the old stoic farmer. So to, this, to my, my dad, StatsCan would phone him, and his, what was his answer when StatsCan asked him a question? Go to hell. Well, dad, that's, that's real nice. He's angry about anyone giving any information. This is my information. This isn't yours. My dad went into a personal care home, and, and, my, and we were in there, and the lady that was helping him was hard to understand, so I was kind of translating. And she went, so, Mr. Olson, do you want everyone, do you want us to publish when you have your birthday? So we could, no, I don't want the government knowing anything. Yeah, no, put it down here. I don't want people to know it's his birthday. And the lady's like, he didn't say that. I'm like, trust me, just, it's just him being him. That is going to be important. It's going to tell your story. ESG, don't think it's not, you're not going to be part of this. Carbon, you know, carbon credits, the carbon market, carbon offsets, you're going to need to understand this because everyone's coming for it. Everyone's going to be asking the questions, and it's not going away. This, this has nothing to do with, with legislation about not paying carbon tax. This is just the reality of what, our, what the new world is, is that that's the environment we live in. And the ESG is coming too. So you're going to need to tell your story, and that's going to help. And the more organized you are, the better it'll be. Some clothing thoughts. Hey, I'm on time. Actively communicate. So take some time. This is hard, but actively communicate. That means it isn't just that superficial stuff. My father talked to me superficially a lot until I got a little older and... You know, he couldn't get away from me because he had Parkinson's, so he had to listen to me talk at him. 
that didn't work well. Know your competitive advantage. Think about your farm. What are you good at? Well, that's fantastic, but you need to understand where your advantages are and on your business. Back to the plan. If you plan it, you quantify it, you can manage it, right? You should know where that's at. Write it down. Write it down. You, you know, we have clients that do the, do the rental agreements. Well, I'm not going to go to a lawyer. It's just, you know, I've been dealing with Frank. He'll, he's not, he, he won't deal with me if we write it down. Well, just tell Frank you write it down. You're doing the same thing as you're doing if you say it to him. You don't have to write, you don't, okay, well, if anybody who's in the legal community, I apologize. You don't need to go to a lawyer to do a, a land rent. You can write out, I'm renting this, this is what I'm paying you, and this is what I'm doing. So look for your risks. Think about mitigating risk, if you want. But act, if you don't, actively don't. Don't do nothing or not know. Not knowing is not a great example. You know, I worked, when I did the farm debt days, we had clients who would just say, well, I'm not as bad as him, and uh, hopefully it gets better. Hopefully it doesn't work. Data, think about that now on your own farm, and start learning, like we have ways, come talk to us, there's an ad for MNP. I have to do that once in a while or Stu won't pay me. Trust the next generation. If you're doing a succession plan, you gotta start trusting them. Because trust is important. They've got different skill sets than you do. Like, I, I have a, um, one of our consultants, Christelle Harper, has got a home-based business. She sells uh, grass-fed beef out of Brandon. And she does regenerative agriculture. It's all, she moves, they actually move their cattle three times a day during the summer. I'm like, what are you doing? And of course, she's, she's mad, because I'm terrible with her. I'm like, well, that sounds dumb. Well, it seems to work. Fantastic beef, remind me of the beef, uh, beef that I grew up on. Trust them, these guys, are, these guys are going to school and they're passionate. And they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna do things and say things that, you don't, that you're not thinking of. You know, I, I think about Blackberries, right? Well, with computers, I'm the generation, when I started FC, we didn't even have computers. Can you imagine hand bomb and stuff? I'm dyslexic. Can you imagine getting my notes? Holy doodle, I don't know how they actually survive. Trust the next generation. Because the journey's fun with your next generation, but you gotta start it early, and you gotta start communicating early. Because unfortunately, lots of times by the time we hit those clients and they're 35, the next generation's 35, 40, guess who they've learned that great communication skills from? Well, they're exactly like dad. So now we got two people swearing at each other. I'm like, God. Think about it. Think about actively doing it. Think about skill sets that you can develop around that. I work in an accounting firm. I'll give you a skill set on, on active communication. I am an extrovert. This might shock people. I work with introverts. The people that work on Farm Management Canada, Stu Person, is not an introvert. He's weird for an accountant. They're like, he's kind of weird. Ezel, well, there we go. Oh, Rick, Rick's not an introvert either. Sure you're an accountant, Rick? So we have issues. Remember you talked about issues? So I like dealing with issues right away. So I'd get somebody who would piss me off. We had a, <laughs> Allison Kennedy, she was, she's retired. I loved Allison. Allison would send me snarly emails after six o'clock. And when I first got in work, I would just grab the email, print it off, walk into her office. Eight o'clock next morning, sit down. And she'd be like, what, what, uh. So I'd leave. So Allison and I had to do a deal. This is communication. I said, Allison, you're gonna write me shitty emails. And I'm gonna read them. And then I'm gonna take a breath. The next morning, I'm going to respond to you, and we're going to set up a meeting that afternoon, and then we can talk about it. And after that, she would send the email. The next morning, she'd send me another email and go, forget the email, I'm sorry. I was just, <laughs> it's after six, right? you got to figure out those communications. And as parents, this is my last one I'll give you. As the, as the older generation, it's on you. It's not on the kids, because you're in the power position. It's a buy-sell agreement. You own everything. So it's your job. It's your job to set the tone. It's your job. It, you're always the parent. It's the way it works. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Hopefully I woke you up this morning, because I know a few of you are in the bar, I'm sure, last night. I can tell you're a little, a little groggy. Um, afterwards, if you guys ever want to take a look at them, I do have the books uh, from my grandparents' farm, and they're kind of neat to look. Um, 
like their, the way they did their, their monitoring of animals. Right now we have to keep track of every animal over so many months, right? My, my grandmother just named her Ivy, so we had to keep track of Ivy. Oh. No, I can do that, sure. Smuggled mental health is a key, is a key risk factor. What is, what quantify? <laughs> so the mental health risk, everything's different in mental health. So I'm not an expert on this. But every, everyone in this, in this room has probably had it and touched their lives. And, and back, there was a time when no one ever talked about it, right? Oh, you know, something wrong with it. So um, I, I'll use a great example, personal example of mental health. My son, my son had some anxiety, right? And, he's, and he's, he's now 30, discovered he was dyslexic. So his mother is a people and culture manager. She has an executive uh, designation from the London School of Business for uh, coaching. His dad's me, like, look at this, I'm fantastic, right? Um, so he was working in, uh, in uh, HR, and pandemic hit, met a girl from Brandon, so we live in Winnipeg, met a girl from Brandon, quit his job, moved to Brandon, and decided he wanted to be a carpenter. And there's nothing wrong with the trades, don't get me wrong, but I'm like, you want to be a carpenter? When did, you grew up in the same Vitel. He grew up, he grew up as a city kid. Think about that, city kid. Moved out there, bought a house, fell in love. I'm going to be a grandfather. That'd be great. I'm going to be called Papa. That's what I'm, I'm Swedish. That's what we're going to do. The point, though, is we had to adapt through that because he because now he's the happiest he's ever was. So if he would have been a farm kid, that poor kid would have been farming and hating every minute of it. So that's about communication. Mental health about quantifying. I think we just need to keep it up and not be scared to talk about someone who's having a bad day. So we have, we have code words in our family. We call it, are you having a bad day? I don't go, and, and, and if someone's actually depressed, going and asking them, are you depressed? That really works great. Are you having a bad day? You know, what are some things you can do? Have you had, you know, have you had something to eat? Like there's things that we do that can help on that. And I, I'm no expert. I think it's something we need to think about. Three things to better trust the next. <laughs> trust the next. They're smarter than we are. Most of the times they work harder. But treat it like an, this is the thing that I always find interesting on farms. We get, kind of get two options. We get the one option where this is my son, and this is, or this is my daughter, and obviously they're the smartest people in the world because they're related to me. So this is going to be great, right? The other one is, I call it the hockey coach. So I coached hockey. And, and I, when I went to hockey coaching, I took all the courses, but I learned one thing, is I, did, I worked twice as hard not to be harder on my kid than everyone else. So a lot of cases, you're going to be harder on your own kids than you are on your employees, right? The second thing is, get them trained. Give them skill set that you don't have, right? That's, in, that's really cool. In terms of trusting them, train them. And, and, and talk about... Think about what they have to learn going forward. Because their skill set's different than ours. Like my skill set was never <laughs> driving a tractor. I always said I wish I had a brother who could have farmed. Or a sister. I had two sisters and one of them farmed. I could have been part of the farm. And I'd have been like Stuart. I'd be a Hollywood farmer. Farm 7,200 acres and i just drive home once in a while and take a look at it. That's the way to farm. And then when they lose money, maybe that's not that quite the way to farm. But again, when you want to trust the next generation, it's about, it's about, it's about not today. <coughs> It's about a whole bunch of days, and it's a bunch of discussions. It's not just, that's the one problem with succession planning. With our, with our office, we, we offer, we have a succession planning service. This should be done all the time. This should be just part of the deal, part of the deal, and it isn't, and it's important. m &P, we do it all the time. So when I started, remember I said there was, uh, I worked for Terry Batker, right? Terry, Terry, Terry worked for me. He was, I worked for Terry. There was me and Terry. Terry left in 2010, I think. We are now 35 farm consultants across the firm. So we've done a lot, and we've grown that, and it's, and it's a constant succession plan. So I plan on retiring. I'm not like Elaine. <laughs> I'm not working till I'm. I know you're passionate about it. I apologize. That's fantastic. My mother, my mother was a nurse. She did home care until she was 71. She was driving around and caring about home care. Um, so our succession plan is we develop other partners. Will's not here right now. We develop the next generation. That's what our job is in the firm, and that's what your job is as, as farmers. So, good? Okay. 
Thank you very much.